of time, we can get started and I think people will continue to join. Uh, so I wanna welcome everybody to our social medicine seminar series co-sponsored by the DG SOM, the, the uh, David Geffen School of Medicine research theme in health equity and translational social science and also by the Center for Social Medicine, their Rangel lecture series. So I wanna warmly welcome you to what, an event that I've been looking forward to <laughs> very, with a lot of excitement because I'm going to present to you a woman without whom I would not be. Uh, she is my mentor, my idol, <laughs> um, my family. <laughs> she feels like family um, and she just continues to tear up the field of, of mental health, um, of healthcare in general in relation to a really very pervasive source of structural racism, which is a geographic one, um, American cities, cities inside and outside of the US. Uh, and even though her talk today may not focus on that whole body of work, she is, absolutely a pioneer and has written canonical works in psycho psychology of place on the impact of race and class segregation of US cities on health inequalities and really in, in exciting um, ways how we can directly redress those sources of division and segregation as a health intervention. So she is someone who now regularly collaborates with urban planners, architects to redesign US cities and has done major work in places like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Orange, New Jersey, founded the University of Orange based on these principles of involving people at the grassroots level who've been affected by displacement and segregation in projects, major projects to redress that and integrate socially and spatially. Um, and she's now going to be talking about an exciting new topic of, um, at least for me, <laughs> in learning about her work, which is um, Korean dramas. So I'm going to say one word from her very understated and traditional bio uh, regarding the fact that she's formally trained as a social psychiatrist and she's a professor of urban policy now. Um, and urban policy and health at the New School. Since 1986, she's conducted, and this is, I was her, I was her uh, mentee and intern as a, as a sophomore in college. And had I not been exposed to her work as an intern, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. I can really say that. Uh, so I came on board shortly after she um, formed the HIV Center at Columbia. And she's been researching AIDS and other epidemics of poor communities for decades. I, I did mention psychology of place and segregation. So she's now evolved into a doctor of cities. She no longer treats individual patients, so to speak. She's, she treats the pathologies of cities. Uh, she's published hundreds of articles, I'm sure, and eight books, including, I highly recommend, the trilogy Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It, Urban Alchemy, Restoring Joy in America's Sorted Out Cities, and most recently Main Street, How a City's Heart Connects Us. Thank you so much for joining us, Mindy. Fully love. Thanks, Helena, for that lovely introduction. And uh, thanks for letting me come virtually as opposed to on a plane. Uh, so the, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Um, and as Helena mentioned, I'm gonna talk about K-drama. And this is because obviously I've been home during the pandemic and watching TV as many Americans have. And I got tired of American TV, British TV, Danish TV, French TV. So I started watching K Korean TV, which is generously supplied on Netflix. And uh, absolutely fell in love with K-drama. Uh, and this is very much my, my roots as a psychiatrist. This like, because these shows to me are shows about, here's an impossible situation and how is this person gonna get through this? 
And it's just always the case that in these shows, you can't, you don't get through it the way you start it. You have to grow. You have to grow so that you can encompass the new situation. And so this led to many kinds of thoughts. Uh, and as Helena said, I, she thought I should disclose uh, that um, learning Korean and going to Korea to uh, next um, on sabbatical this coming year. And so I'm going to Korea in the spring semester. I'm going to have an intensive course in Korean at Sogang University. And um, so for the purposes of writing a book about the Tao of Kejom. But what I, so what I want to talk to you about today is character and context. And there are, you know, sort of all kinds of important Korean cultural ideas that I'm not going to talk about because I, I just want to follow the, the sort of old axiom, show, don't tell. If I say this is about Han or this is about something else in Korean culture, I haven't actually showed you. And, and that's not what they do. They don't say, wow, this is Han. They show you. And that's the, for me, really the miracle of this art form that K-dramas, as many of you know, have 16 episodes or 20 episodes or 24 episodes to tell a story. So, the, and these are one hour or one hour and a half episodes, so plenty of time. And they use that time to go very meticulously through what's happened to the person. It's very much a show. It's, it's very much sort of granular um, what, you know, almost, you know, they start with breakfast, what they had for breakfast, and then what are they going to wear to work? And then, um, you know, taking off their shoes, they're always taking off their shoes, putting on their slippers. It was very meticulous. They have a lot of time to show us what happens to the person. So I picked 2521, which is currently very popular K-drama. Uh, and largely because the premise is that the IMF crisis throws a series of young people out of their lives and how do they get started again? So that's what I'd like to talk with you about. And I'm sure some in the audience, just cause many in the US love K-drama as much as I do. I'm sure that some people have seen this, if not, um, and we'll have lots of things to say. And if not 25, 21, you know about K-drama. And I don't know why this is being slow, but being slow. I'm gonna stop the share and try again. Um, uh oh. No, for a second, everybody disappeared. It's really scary. Um, all right. I'm gonna try sharing it, we'll see if that works. No, sorry, that's the wrong thing. Dun, 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 go away. This slideshow. Is it going to load? Yes. Thank you all for your patience. So, the idea of what happens to a person when the context changes is, of course, one that's there's a very popular idea in art. One that really made an impression on me, play that I read when I was a, a avid drama student as a teenager was J.M. Barry's Admiral Creighton. Um, so J.M. Barry wrote Peter Pan. So obviously he's interested in, let's change the context and see what happens. So Admiral Creighton is the butler, is, you know, is really the butler in, for a wealthy family. The family goes uh, for a cruise, gets shipwrecked on a desert island, and Creighton is the only person who knows how to do anything. So he becomes the leader of the whole group. And of course, the daughter of the house who previously loved Lord so-and-so falls in love with Crichton because he's really competent and fabulous. Then they get rescued and they go back and, and everything goes back to what it was. But the, the Jay and Barry is very interested in how the positions are changed because the conditions are changed. And so this is one of a photograph from one of many productions of this play, which has been a film and a play. Anyway, a profound idea. If, if you're in this context, who are you? But if you're in that context, who are you? So 2521, as it says, is you know, heartfelt and hopeful. 
sets us on a journey with two young people whose big dreams for the future are trampled by circumstances far beyond their control. Despite the age gap between them, they come to recognize each other as kindred spirits against the often cruel realities of life. So in this case, it's the night, this is in 1998, and it's the Asian financial crisis that's thrown everything apart. This was a pretty short-lived crisis, but had profound effects. Lots and lots and lots of bankruptcies uh, in the affected countries, and South Korea was one of them. One of the things I, I think that's just gripping about the way these K-dramas are told, and, and sort of in the anatomy of K-drama, I would say it's in the anatomy of K-drama, is that there is a tangle of people. And the tangle of people, you know, has conflicts and cooperation and ways in which it works together, ways in which it doesn't. It's the tangle of people that's moving through the arc of the 16 hours. And, uh, you know, this sort of tangle is twist together in a confused mass or, or a confused mass of something twisted together. It's this, uh, the people are in a tangle. The, so one of the things that Helena mentioned that I've worked on in relationship to upheaval is a term I've called root shock which is a term I borrowed from gardeners who point out that if, if you rip a plant out of the ground, you're gonna tear its roots and it may or may not be able to recover. So the idea of, of root shock is that the, this, the destruction of the root system sends a shock through the whole system and of, of the plant. And this is, I have found true of, of people, of social systems as well. It's true at the individual level, it's true at the level of families, it's true at the level of small organizations and at the level of neighborhoods and nations. Um, I described, I defined, because I was inventing the term, so I defined it as the traumatic shock reaction to the loss of all or part of one's emotional ecosystem. And in that regard, one could say that at this moment, the whole world is in root shock, literally the whole world. Between the COVID pandemic and global warming, we have lost important parts of our emotional ecosystem. And as we rebuild, we'll be rebuilding the next thing because things spiral, they don't circle. We're not going back to where we were. We have to go, we have to go forward, it's evolutionary. And this is quite hard on people. In the in theory of social psychiatry, there's, uh, just as roots are held in a matrix of the ground, character is held in a matrix of society. Now this is very contrary to, I think the way psychiatry and psychology think about character as a stable part of the human. I, I have a certain character and I will have that character under all conditions. J.M. Barry, for example, is saying, no, you're gonna be that character if you're in England, but you're gonna be a different character if you're on a deserted island. So character is expressed in the context of the matrix in which the person finds themselves. So the, this is what I think, uh, there's this root shock of the Asian financial crisis and what these characters are going through. At the heart of the story are uh, this, a tangle of characters, but there are three that are particularly important. Becky Jin, who is, a uh, scion of a wealthy family. And this is Becky Jin in his new red convertible that he got for graduating from high school. And he's from, the, uh, you know, so obviously this is a sign of wealth. And as he's driving down the street, a beautiful young woman throws a phone on the seat next to him and says, when it rings, pick it up. Just as a sign of, of what he's entitled to because he's from a wealthy family. The family is bankrupted by this. And one of the things my teacher told me that happens in a bankruptcy is that, is that they come in and they label everything in the house and everything is sold. So the family has to, has to divide. We learn at one point that the father is a financial criminal. And so he has to pseudo divorce his wife and be apart from his children in order to manage this. And at that point, Becky Jin says, well, where should I go? 
So this is a, a young man who's in his second year of college, dreams of being an engineer. He's, you know, really got everything. And all of a sudden he has nothing and not even a place to go. He goes briefly to the military, but with his family's bankruptcy, they say, it's time for you to protect your family instead of the country. And so he ends up renting a room in Seoul and getting part-time jobs. So it's complete, complete transformation of the, of the life path that he thought he was on. At one point we learned that there are 400, at that time, 455,000 young people who were thrown out of college. So there are many people in his position and so lots of competition for all kinds of jobs. The second person is Nahido, who is a young fencer, whose the fencing team at her school is closed. And so she, her mother says, so just give up fencing, just study, go to college. Um, and then the third person that we'll talk about is Koyorim. So the, there's a formation of a friendship group. And in the anatomy of K-drama, this, this is a very important part of the story. And sort of, as I think about it, in sort of episodes one to 10, you're establishing the set of relationships and certainly the central romance. And then in 11 through 16, people have to solve whatever problems have been put on their plate. So this is the period where the group is coming together, the group that will do the work. And social psychiatry is very fundamental that strong social systems do work. So this, this really is something to me worth observing how, how they tracked this. So Becky Jin, one of his part-time jobs is delivering newspapers. He throws the newspaper onto the lawn of Nahido, but misses the lawn, knocks the penis off the peeing boy. Um, and she screams at him, they get to know each other. Nahido wants to transfer to the school attended by the gold medal fencer Koyorim. And Becky Jin's family used to sponsor Koyorim, so they know each other. And Becky Jin attended that high school and was a star of several clubs. So when Naido gets to the school, she then meets the two other people that are going to be in this group, Munji Wang, who's a cool kid, and his diaper buddy, Ji Shung, Ji Shung Wan. I say that, Ji Shung Wan. So this is the, the gang of lovely people. So these stories pivot and every chapter has to end on a cliffhanger so that people will come back and keep watching. And so 2521 is no different. So one of the pivots in the story is that, is that Becky Jin and his younger brother are hounded by his father's creditors. So he promises them that he will find the money to repay them and that he won't be happy until they're repaid. Nahido overhears this and says he can be happy when they're alone together. And, and this becomes the beginning of their romance. This is very fun though for fundamental moment in Becky Jin's life because absent she takes him under her wing, he, uh, you know, one thinks of the things that happen to people when the world has disintegrated and they're feeling miserable and they're being hounded and they have to work part-time jobs, you know, drugs, alcohol, suicide, all of those things. But Nahido says, no, 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 no. We'll just play and you can be happy. And, but only some of the, you know, in public, you can look sad. So she throws off that his idea that he could never be happy. This is very fundamental to him beginning to have a new life. And, and I think as part of, you know, the, the, the moral of the story actually hinges on this and similar moments. Nahido herself is going to go to a new school. So first she has a real problem with how to switch schools. She finally gets there. Then she meets her hero, Koyurim, who is very mean to her and ref just refuses to basically even start to speak to her. So they really start out as enemies and both are loners. Uh, but Nahido has a chance to compete for the national team. So she really settles down to, to work on her fencing and, be, and really makes a breakthrough in her fencing. So new school, new challenges is the pivot, huge pivot in Nahido's life. So um, Nahido's mom is the anchor at a news station. 
And she advocates for hiring high school graduates, for, for lifting the demand for college degrees. And Becky Jin takes the journalism exam and gets a job, and he sets out to prove himself. So, so he is willing to go forward, but he says of his life, I don't have dreams, I just want to do well, which is, uh, I think, quite one of, one of the real markers of how he's been permanently changed by what has happened to him. Now, Nahido has a friend, has a, you know, sort of a you've got male friend that she shares her feeling with, and that friend is Injilmi, but it turns out that this is Koyurim. So when the truth is revealed, they switch from being, from being enemies to being best friends. And this is fundamental for Koyurim, who is very isolated, very frightened. Her family's in terrible financial trouble. And so this be, there, there are sort of several threads that begin to coax her out of her shell, help her connect to other people, help her be part of the group. And so another pivot in the story is this loach soup. And the key characters all converge at Ji Shun Wan's house where her mother's making the soup, but the loaches get knocked over and they're wiggling all over the floor. And so this, sorry for the typo, the soon to be a gang gathers them up and then they eat soup together. Now they aren't, so Koyurim and Nahido aren't getting along at that point. So it's a little awkward um, and, so, but they're, but they're eating together, this photo of this, and it's very, very important in, in the sort of the unfolding of the story, that now you've got a group, it's going to have adventures together, they're going to solve problems. And um, so Becky Jin is a part of this group, not because they're all in high school, he's not in high school, he's a graduate of their high school, so he's like a near peer. Um, but but they, they love him, they lean on him, he helps them out. Um, and so he becomes for them in a way, something he's not for himself. Like they become devoted to him and admiring of him, which helps him because his self-esteem has taken a terrible blow. Um, but he becomes somebody who gives them good advice. He's, he's a very sound person. Um, and in a, in the way that happens to all of us, we don't always know how to use our own good advice, but he can give them good advice. And in the sense that one of the ways to really learn a subject is to teach it to somebody else. Teaching them growing up, you suspect, helps him grow up. So but the next piece is that Munji Wong is courting Ko Yorim. And she says to him, she doesn't like fans who flatter her. And he says, I am not your fan. He's a lovely young man who uh, basically is not going to go to college. He's going to make his own way and it's going to come fabulously rich as a fashion designer because he just has an eye for clothes. But, he, but he's lovely. He's very kind and is constantly just by her side, reassuring her. And the, the peeling away of her hardness, her fear, her meanness uh, happens very much between the, the love that he has for her and the love that Naido has for her at the point at which they realize, wait, wait, we're best friends on the internet and we can be best friends in real life. The, so Koya Reem's crisis comes in the middle of this. Her family is deeply in debt. The father has a traffic accident and gravely injures the driver of the car he hits. And the driver's family demands restitution or jail. So Ko Yurim decides to take an offer to fence for Russia as that will solve the family's financial problems. She's a very, very popular athlete, a, a real idol in Korea. And so this is seen as, as betrayal. Like how could you go fence for Russia? You're a traitor. So she gets a lot of, you know, her former fans are now very, very angry at her, but her friend group holds her very tight um, and there's a cute scene where they're giving her presents as she's getting ready to go. And they give her a list of sayings in Russian. Um, and of course, one of them is, <laughs> I have a boyfriend and his name is Munji Wong. Um, so the, the, all the things that she's gonna need to say. And then there's a cute scene when she arrives in Russia where she says this, list of, not the boyfriend, but the list of things, very cute. So, Koyurim is looking into going to Russia. This becomes big news. The family is like, we don't, we don't want you to go away to repay our debt. The, the parents are, are very heartbroken by this. But she says, I want to put an end to this misery, the, the misery of their poverty. 
Uh, and so she goes, she resettles. So here's a, a, a strong tangle of friends in a, you know, a, a network of families that are more loosely connected, but in a society that has some very coherent and um, messages that are given by everybody. One, one of the messages that's given by everybody is we are a society. And so you can't do whatever you want. You, ha you have to do things that help society, literally if things that help society. So at one point, Becky Jin says, uh, has a fight with somebody and his mentor says, you have to apologize. And Becky Jin is really resisting this. And he said, what are you gonna do? Make it uncomfortable for everybody to come to work? We live in a society, you have to apologize. Um, so the, the sort of coherence of the message is for me as somebody living in the United States and watching the incoherence of our messages, really striking the, that these people are in a moment of turmoil, of upheaval, but the society is not disintegrated in the way I would describe American society as being disintegrated. So that's helpful. It's helpful that there's somewhat solid ground of the society. And within that, there's this strong group of people who are really trying to not only help themselves, but help each other. So Becky Jin has a series of depressions and setbacks at, at one point, flees, promises not to be happy, gets his lucky break, where he's working to do well, but not dreaming, which he was before. He happens to be, he becomes a reporter and goes to the US after 9-11 and has PTSD. So very difficult time, which is when he turns to pills and alcohol and cigarettes. Uh, so we have some anxiety, like, you know, what's going to happen to this kid? But he gets back on his feet and eventually becomes the news anchor, takes the position Nahido's mother had held. And it, interestingly and importantly, not because he had the red car that his dad gave him and he drove down the street, but because of his own hard work. And, and they show you how hard he works because this is very much a show, don't tell kind of art form. Naido fights to get into the school with the fencing team, eventually becomes a world champion, has a romance with Becky Jin, but can't bear the way his job as a reporter takes him away, which is exactly like her mother. And so eventually she's like, I can't take it and breaks up with him. Marries somebody else and has a kid. Koya Reem sacrifices for her family and solves that problem, eventually is able to repatriate to Korea. Um, but during the period when she's in Russia and she's getting ready to, she's getting ready to, com to compete with Nahido, who will be representing Korea, Koya Reem will be representing Russia. She pulls away, but they pull her back in. Um, so they keep the connection, keep her grounded. And she returns home to start a fencing studio. And of course, marries Unji Wong. Um, so the, so the characters move in this tangle of relationships, moving in and out of each other's lives, helping each other, giving each other support, giving each other guidance, fighting with each other. They all are moving through this perturbation in the world, um, and not in lockstep, but next to each other, sort of side by side. And, and there's no question that the concept of by my side is one that K-dramas really try to teach that in relationships, part of your job is to be by the side of the people you love. And so these people are really by each other's side, this, this group of five. So, you know, sort of, so what happens? What happens to character if you go through something like that? And of course, Becky Jin is, is at the center of this. And he's at, on several occasions confronted by people who say, you're not a young master anymore. So who are the young masters? So the young masters are the children of these wealthy families, the, the tribal families who have incredible amounts of privilege and power and money and who live you know, in a sort of, what my teacher describes as an evolving caste system. They're, they're you know, made out by their parents to be better than other people. Like there are the commoners and then there's this aristocracy. This scene from another K-drama, Boys Over Flowers, I, I think really captures this uh, young master thing. Um, and so the, the F4 who are these, the, 
this flower, four flowers of the school, come strolling into school, but the, the word spreads that they're arriving. And so everybody in the school comes pouring down into the lobby to clap for them as they walk into the school. And they haven't personally done anything other than be born to a rich family, but they get all this adulation. So this is the young masters, and this is what Becky Jin has taken away from him. So at a certain point when he gets the job as the anchor, as the news anchor for this important TV station, so very important position, he walks into the room and everybody's clapping for him, but he bows very humbly to everybody. But he is not there because he's the son of a wealthy family. He's there because he had a lot of talent and he worked hard and he was, he was very committed to doing his job um, over some very, very difficult, you know, sort of things that he had to surmount. He does his job, he does it well, and he's achieved this position. And so this scene where he's walking in, everybody's clapping, and he's not like the F4 wearing a fur coat. He's you know wearing an ordinary suit and he bows. This is really fundamentally about the shift in his character, who he has become as a result of what was said before him, how it changed his material conditions and therefore changed who he was. Embodiment is a very popular term this, these days. So I think these two contrasting moments of embodiment, this is Lee Ho Min uh, in, uh, it's, I think really the role that made him famous, sorry, Lee Min Ho in the role that made him famous. So awesome stage presence, just, you know, commanding this scene in the lobby. Uh, but here is Becky Jin, who's had to pull himself up by his bootstraps, very humbly bowing to the crowd. That's in his body that he's he's not at the top he's he's a worker among workers so so some thoughts about this um and really i i think that you know the the um the teaching of k drama is really in this show don't tell you don't have to pay attention to any of this if you're watching k drama and most people don't they're very interested in how will the romance work out and you know, if it doesn't work out the way they want, they're upset, or they, or if it works out the way they want, they're really glad. Um, my class studied crash landing on you, and of course, we followed the romance um, of the of the leads, and they're getting married, we're like yay! So you don't have to pay attention to any, any of this other stuff that's going on if you don't want to. Um, but there are, I find, some things that they are showing about how to live a good life how to be a person who contributes to society, who is peaceful, who has some stability, even in crisis. Not that this is easy. They're making it very clear this is not easy, but you, this is how you do it. And one part of it is there are consistent social messages that there are needs and demands of society. And you're supposed to be paying attention to those. You're not supposed to be fooling around about that. You, you have, everybody has something to contribute to society. Uh, one of the shows, another recent show, very, very popular, Hometown Cha-Cha-Cha, was very consistently actually said that message. This is what you're supposed to do to make society better. And some of it is simple things like old people get smelly, so take a shower every day or brush your teeth. Uh, and some of it is, is more profound. Join the organizations and, you know, if the people in the neighborhood are cleaning up the garbage, go clean up the garbage. So. Within that, class position is one source of power. Personal talent is another source of power. So when Becky Jin loses his class position, it's his personal talent that becomes a source of power that he can use. Um, the collective roots that people have, the, the collective roots people, but these can be ephemeral, ephemeral. And if you know about vernal pools, they like, uh, water that collects in the spring, which is a whole ecosystem for many, many species. And then they dry up over the summer. So these collectives come and go, but they're very nourishing during their existence. So upheaval dislocates the self. So if you don't happen to have talent, a strong social group, um, then the negative could win. And Korea has high rates of alcoholism and suicide. So some of the pressures of a society that has rapidly emerged from feudalism to become a capitalist power are very, very, very hard 
on on the members of the society. Um, my teacher always tells me that her relatives for the holidays would say to her, study hard, you know, not happy new year, study hard. Um, uh, and, and it's really more than just a saying, it's an actual real belief, like just go study hard. So one of the things I, I thought to, I'd like to put out is that it seems to me that one of the messages from 2521 is that the group creates the foundation for moral decisions that left to our own devices, you know, we become rather primitive, sort of how do I eat? How do I sleep? How do I not feel so terrible? But when we're in a group and we have help, then we can say, okay, I'm, I am hungry, but I shouldn't steal. Or I am feeling bad, but I could cry on my friend's shoulder. I, I don't have to be mean to somebody else. And so this is, I think, fundamentally important for us to understand um, as people who do social psychiatry, social medicine, that the strength of the society is really the source of our ability to be moral, our ability to be humane, and our, and our ability to keep our species alive. So that is the end, and I'm going to stop the share, and that's it. That's what I have to say about 25, 21. I hope you all really enjoyed it. Hi. So I'm having some problems with my camera, but that was amazing, Mindy. Thank you so much. Um, and I know that there are going to be a number of questions. Uh, please put questions in the chat as you think of them. Um, but I, I want to ask you first, I mean, what an amazing journey from your readings of a popular Korean drama to implications for us, not only in psychiatry and healthcare, but for us as a society. And so um, I just wanted to ask you, what, how are you positioning this work these days? Are you, are you in conversation with colleagues in healthcare or in urban planning or your many, many students and former students in those areas about how we can draw on the insights from Korean drama. You know, which directions would you want to take the linkages, the really amazing linkages that you just met? Um, well, I think you're a step ahead of, of me. <laughs> I'm trying to understand. Uh, I was joking with my teacher today that um, that that I'm really convinced that K drama is all metaphor, that everything is between the lines. And she was like, yeah, that, that's what, that's true. And your job is to crack the code. So I'm really trying to crack the code. And I, you know, so I would, I would not at all say I've cracked the code. There was a scene um, in Hometown Cha 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 where um, the, the young woman's father is talking to the guy, the, you know, possible boyfriend and uh, who's who got on his nerves by talking to him informally. It's a big deal in Korea. And so at the, as it, the dad is about to leave, he asks the, the young man to come and he whispers to him something. And the subtitle say, he said, you bastard. I don't, I didn't like the way you spoke to me, you bastard. And I was like, and, and the, the, the young man is shocked. And the dad is kind of smiling. And his wife turns to him and says, you liked him, didn't you? And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. So of course I made my teacher watch it. And she said, no, you said in such a word, which I don't remember, um, which means like, it's like an endearment for children or it means it, like little darling, if you're saying it to an adult. So he actually used an endearment to him, which was very friendly. It was informal, you know, it was going beyond the boundaries of what their relationship was in a way mirroring what the young man had done in speaking to him informally, going beyond the boundaries of what the relationship was. So um, that's part of the code. Uh, obviously it helps if you know Korean, more Korean than I know. I know a lot of Korean. Uh, so does that make any sense, Helena? Did I answer your question? Did I just go off on a tangent? <laughs> I'm trying to crack the code. <laughs> if I crack the code, I'll tell you. <laughs> I hope you can hear me because I'm having some problems right yeah. now with my computer. 
But, I can uh, do. <laughs> that makes total sense. And I also wondered about the popularity of Korean drama in the US right now, which I'm sure is due to many, many different factors, including the fact that the country of Korea invested a lot in media and in cracking yeah. international media markets. That's something I actually learned at an addiction medicine conference that was hosted in Korea. Um, but I, maybe there's something more than that. You know, I, I'm wondering if any of the lessons that you are giving us from Korean drama uh, about how we should be thinking about mental health, health and society, is that a part of the resonance that Korean dramas have with us in the US right now? But what's the relationship, if any? Well, obviously, there's a lot of layers. Okay, I'm going to start at the most crass. I started watching K-drama. And, you know, they do close-ups of these movie stars, these guys. And I'm like, good God. I was like, I never knew this, like, variety of male beauty existed. Okay, I just had to say that, get that out of the way. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I don't know if that's happened to anybody else in the audience, but you know, Kim Nam Gil just blew my mind, just blew my mind. And I was like, oh my God. So I think a lot of people start at that level. They're really beautiful. And if you just never thought about Korea and never thought about Korea, it's pretty shocking. Like, wow, such beautiful people. I just want to look at them all day. But then they have these adventures, like remarkable, silly adventures, like time travel and, you know, historical dramas and this and that. And so and it's stories I never heard before. I'm somebody who loves fairy tales. So it's like, it's like, it's like, uh, when I was young, I used to read that they had this yellow fairy book, red fairy book, blue fairy book, green fairy book. And this like discovering, wait, there's a Korean, all of these, like the red fairy book, the yellow, Korean yellow fairy book, red fairy book. So it's like a whole new world of fairy tales. It's just wonderful. Uh, but, the, and then in the course of that, I was like watching, Live Up to Your Name, which was the first K-drama I saw. And at one point, the mentor turns to this young doctor and says, so now that you're enlightened, what are you going to do? And I was like, when did he become enlightened? I was just like, the romance, and he's so handsome, and the time travel. When did he become enlightened? So I watched it again, trying to figure out when did he become enlightened? So Helena, I, I think there's so many ways you could connect to these stories. Plus, they're archetypal stories. They're just really stories of all cultures. So they call to us very deeply. And they're different. They're, the way they tell the art, the way they tell Rapunzel is different. So it's enchanting. So, um, and also I think that it has deep roots in their long form storytelling. And also in uh, how, they, how they teach people really from a very early age to analyze literature. The writing between the lines, reading between the lines, really working in metaphor. And metaphor is very good for our minds. So the fact that much of this is in metaphor, I think leaves it open to all of us. Does that make any sense? There must be some people in this audience that also watch K-drama. <laughs> case it that somebody wants sense. to weigh in that you have an insight into this, our view. <laughs> it absolutely makes sense. And if anyone wants to ask questions directly, do feel free to raise your hand. I'm gonna read from the chat. Uh, there are a couple of questions here. One follows closely on what you're just talking about. Um, it says, uh, I'm wondering if you believe that Asian media's role in broadcasting positive social messages could be translatable in America. Uh, would even covert show don't tell messaging be viewed as propaganda in American individuals culture or could it shift our social norms? So I think it's related to what you're talking about um, with regard to what you know what is appealing here, but I think it's really asking, could others besides yourself with your sharp insight, could we also be um, tapping in to the positive social messaging through the so, so show don't tell mechanism? Do, do you see anything positive going on in America? I, I think art has to reflect reality that's in people's faces. And I think there's some things about Korea people are struggling with. I, I think they're very proud, South Korea is very proud of the way in which they've transformed from feudalism to be the 13th economic power in the world. 
Um, and it's positive. They feel positively about it. Whereas I, I feel like, you know, we're at end of empire, it's falling apart and, and we're not positive. We're fighting with each other. We don't have a coherent social message. I think it would be difficult for us to do this. And also I, I think there's a, I think there's a fundamental optimism about K-drama. That's a big relief for me because I, I think we are living in such uh, pessimism. Just think about the messaging around COVID. It's just ridiculous messaging. How are you going to have? How are you going to have a? You know, what are you going to show? How we have ridiculous messaging around COVID? You know what I mean, Helena? Absolutely. So, so maybe some of us are um, living vicariously off of the, <laughs> the positive momentum <laughs> that's evident in Korea. But drama. I think also it, it gives us ideas, right? So I, I said that their riff on Rapunzel was 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 different. So uh, Gu Yang rookie historian is is the Rapunzel story, but the Rapunzel is the prince, not not the commoner historian, and she has to go get him out of the tower and save him. It's just very delightful. It's very it gives you a lot to think about, a lot of food for thought. Uh, you know, it helps you think about among other things, how do women save men all the time. Excellent point. <laughs> I think related to that is another question in the chat uh, by someone who's been impressed by the didactic nature of K-dramas, particularly for mental health. They have the capacity to normalize. Is there any work about shows like, like this that it's okay to love and it's okay not to be okay to impact mental health stigma? Well, of course, it's okay not to be okay is a great show. Um, <laughs> wait, who was that that just did a thumbs up? I just saw a thumbs up. Yep. Aroase Adelekun. Yep. Uh, it's okay not to be okay is a great show about mental illness. They do a lot to normalize mental illness. Um, have you seen um, Itawan class? I'll oh, see. I found my fan, <laughs> my co fan. <laughs> I knew you were here. <laughs> um, so they do a lot. Um, to try to normalize, you know, to fight stigma um, and to fight to fight the caste system of the wealthy thinking that they're better than the, the commoners. Um, it's a, it's an, they do a lot around women's oppression, what's happening to women. They do a lot around the problems of, of working mothers. So it's, a, it, there's a lot of critique involved, a lot of, a lot of teaching in, in a very gentle way. But oh, go ahead, finish. No, I was going to say, does anybody want to weigh in on that? But does everybody agree with me? Here I am oh, with you. Hi, new Ellen. location. <laughs> new location. So, um, so actually, I, I wonder whether you could comment in a in a slightly more concrete way about how we can draw on the ethos that you've just laid out in our work, you know, in, in healthcare, mental health care, the intersection of healthcare and mental health care with not only society, but the arts and storytelling. Can you think of um, very concrete techniques that we might employ based on this wisdom? You know, my, my larger project um, is to write this book, which is called the Tao of K drama, so it's sort of what is K drama teaching us about the about the way, the way to live, the the way to have serenity, uh, the way to be a good person in the world. So, I I think um, the I mean I think I've just uh, am intrigued by by what it is they're teaching. So part of your question, I don't know the answer yet. Like how do we use their wisdom? I haven't entirely understood it myself, what they're trying to teach. It's a different culture, it's a different language. And a lot of it is between the lines and I don't know how to read between the lines. So um, I am trying to crack the code. Um, but I think um, it's, it's really fundamental to know that Ruchak un undermines our ability to function. And if the whole world is in root shock, whole, the whole world, that's a fundamental truth. If you accept that as a proposition, 
then all of us are dissolving. Everybody's like, oh, it's going to impact the most vulnerable. That's like the stupidest thing you could say right now. No, we're on the verge of the sixth extinction, which is going to wipe us all out. Wrap your mind around that. And what is it doing to young people? It's making them crazy. What is it doing to old people? It's making them crazy, right? Uh, Old people like me, we're in despair because our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, what chance do they have? But the the, our great grandchildren are crazy because what chance do they have? So this sort of like uh, Korea's had a long and difficult history of being invaded by this one and that one, being being feudal, being then the Japanese and then partition. It's a lot of stuff. So they're sort of saying they sort of have two thousand years of a lot of stuff. So it's like yeah, we've been through a lot of stuff, and here's how here's how you do it. Here's how you go through stuff. So if I could tell you what I think they're trying to say, I would. But I think the principle that you can, we can make it through stuff and we can be better to each other. We can be by each other's side. We can be loving. We can be generous, even though it's hard. That uh, these are things that we immediately learn from K-drama. They're right at the surface. Um, but the other thing is that, um, it's not enough to think that what we're supposed to do is go into a clinic and and do whatever we do. It's not enough. And psychiatry has really abandoned its obligation to be working at other levels of scale. So if the whole world is in upheaval, how do we help the world? This is something that urgently needs to be on the agenda, I think, of all healthcare professionals. And when you think about, uh, you know, all the physicians who, who organized like Jack Geiger to fight nuclear war, they understood that that there were things at the level of international conflict that could really kill us all and that they had to organize and be present for that. So I I think that uh, watching K-drama really, it's just really trying to say, no, you're part of society. But everybody in America wants to think it's, I'm really sorry for them. It was like, there, at this point, there's no them. I mean, that's one thing that your work on psychology of place has also highlighted is how harmful it has been to the people who left during white flight, you know, who tried to separate themselves from the others that were suffering. It's harmful to us all. So, I mean, what a beautiful point. I want to lump two different questions together that I think are related. We have a question in the chat about um, whether you're better able to read the subtext of Korean drama in this way because of your social psychiatry training, which begs the question of what is your social psychiatry training and um, what are ways to operationalize telling stories? Isn't that what physicians do when we take a full medical history? Um, so I know there's some people on this call who do narrative medicine. So I want to acknowledge, you know, there is this whole field of narrative medicine that really tries to take that quite seriously and operationalize that. And then I just want to leave one last bundled question related to those about the use of the arts more broadly uh, to build community as a community level health intervention, because I know that you've been involved with that, you know, prior to your study of K-drama. So feel free to enter at any of those (laughs) questions. Yeah. Well, um the so does social psychiatry help me analyze so what is my training as social psychiatrist it is sort of the larger question so it's really in two parts social psychiatry is typically considered a research discipline and uh and so i've done research and and i've read like the classic literature and and worked on how does society shape mental illness so i've worked on that for 40 years but this, the second part of the question is, or the second part of the answer is that I was trained in family therapy. And that really helps you understand systems. And that's why as a social psychiatrist, I feel completely at ease saying, I know how to intervene in large systems. Whether I do or not, I feel like I do. So that's why I feel like, yeah, I'm a doctor for cities. I, people say, what's your clinical practice? Do you have a clinical practice? Like, yes, I treat cities. I do. So there you go. Now. You know, using the arts. So, so if you're if you're going to work at these large systems, what are your tools? There's a lot of tools, but one of them is the arts. 
So Helen, I mentioned I'm a co-founder of the Free People's University of Orange. And one of the projects, very important project at our university is called Music City. Um, and because there are many ethnic groups, many musical cultures in Orange, and, and some really top musicians have observed that the depth of musical talent in Orange is actually exceptional. So the festival brings together people of many, many, many musical traditions. Um, and we have a, an outdoor festival that'll be held in a couple of weeks, and then an annual concert in honor of Rosa Parks, which brings together school choirs and church choirs. So, you know, the arts in many forms, um, when we, or, we organized a project to observe the anniversary of the first landing of Africans at Jamestown in 2019, the 400th anniversary, and people brought many art forms to the, that observance, dance and music and um, painting, many art forms, storytelling. I wonder if we could end with a little description of social psychiatry as a field, the way that you have learned it and helped to create it, because social psychiatry is not very mainstream these days in clinical training, as you know, and we're showing the signs. We don't have the tools that we should have in psychiatry. So no. there, many of us are not familiar. And also, I think you have a specific take on what social psychiatry is and could be. I think I have one minute. Um, so the fundamental principle uh, that I've based myself on was put forward by Alexander Layton in a three volume study of Sterling County where he compared disintegrated and integrated communities. And he said that it's community integration, strong social bonds was the foundation of all health and all mental health. So that's the principle I operate from. And then um, I happened to be in Harlem and other inner city communities through the crack years. And so did studies of, of a whole series of, of epidemics, AIDS, violence, trauma related to violence, asthma, obesity, whole, whole intense series. Um, but also that led us to say, why are there so many epidemics in these neighborhoods? So it's, it's really been the opportunity to spend a lot of time with people that were under these kinds of pressures, asking me, what are the policies that tore this apart and then how might we rebuild? That's been built my vision of what social psychiatry is and could be. That was such a beautiful one minute answer. That was amazing. I'm glad we're recording this. And for everyone's knowledge, we're going to be posting the recording uh, as a YouTube link on our website. I put the link in the chat. Um, feel free to visit the, it's the HETS website, Health Research Team in Health Equity and Translational Social Science. Oh, and Ethel is, Ethel, would you like to mention Ares Areola's event? Sure. We have another HETS event upcoming this Monday. It's a different time. It is from 3 to 4 p.m. Dr. Areola Oni Arasin. Um, will be presenting her work and she is from uh, UCSF. So yeah, maybe we could put a link to that flyer in the chat, but I just wanna thank Mindy Fully Love for yet another just amazing, mind blowing and head turning <laughs> uh, presentation. Always unexpected directions for your research and wisdom from the most, at least in clinical worlds, <laughs> unpredictable places. So thanks again for yet another one of these that just really elevates the discourse. Thank thanks you, again. Helena. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm just gabbing about my TV watching. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually one of two lectures that Mindy Fully Love will be giving for us at UCLA. She's also going to be joining this weekend. Um, is it on Saturday or Sunday? I think you're- Sunday at 9 a.m. if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so there is a conference to which you're all invited of MBPhDs in social sciences and humanities organized by our MBPhD students in social sciences and humanities. And Dr. Fully Love is the keynote. And I would highly recommend because it's on a different topic and you'll find <laughs> that it again mm -hmm. is mind blowing and head turning. So um, I wonder, if, oh yeah, Ethel, I think just put the link to that conference as well in the chat. So thanks again for all of your wisdom. Thanks so much, Helena, for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thank for you. Listening.
was really a pleasure.